And now, podcasting from the sun-scorched desert southwest, weighing in at a combined total of 340 pounds, Brad Winchester, Tyler McDowell Blanket, R. Gimmick Infringement. Welcome, everybody, to the Gimmick Infringement Podcast. I am Brad Winchester, and with me is my tag team partner, Tyler McDowell Blank. And Tyler, it's Sunday, January 8th. As we record this, we had a very busy week in professional wrestling. I am still tired. There is so much to cover. How are you doing today? I'm doing so well, man. Uh, Truer words have never been spoken. 2023 is starting off with so much news in wrestling. I know our goal is always to have 60-minute episodes. Will we hit it? Will we not? Especially this week? I don't know. But I am so excited that you're here. I'm so excited our our audience is listening or watching us right now. We are are so appreciative for your support. And uh, yeah, man, let's, let's get into it. And of course, before we move on, how are you doing? Big week ahead for you, which we'll get into yeah. later, of course. Yeah, doing super well. Thank you. Uh, good, good, good. Getting getting ready to tomorrow. We go back to school. Um, a reminder: you can find us on YouTube. That is probably the best experience for gimmick infringement. Uh, so you can get all the graphics, you can get all the all the fun segment packages. Uh, but we are available on audio wherever you find audio. Uh, and make sure you head over to the Nineteen website. Check us out. If you need links for those things, you can check it out in the description. Uh, but I'm ready to get into it. Tyler, this week, New Japan Pro Wrestling. Not something I thought I would ever be talking about on the show other than maybe this talent goes here or maybe this talent goes there. I stayed up and watched Wrestle Kingdom live. Uh, for, for context, Arizona time, I'm a little bit more spoiled than, uh, than my, my friends and family out east. I know several people that were watching out east who were two hours ahead of us. So... Uh, the 11 o'clock hour is when the pre-show started, but the main card didn't start until about 1 a.m. Arizona time. And at about 4 a.m., I, I was just bleary and my my head was ducking and weaving. And I was I was trying desperately to stay awake. I had to stand up for the the uh, Kenny Omega Will Ospreay match just to keep my eyes open because I was fighting it and I didn't have to wait long. Uh, I was good to go for the Kyrie match. So I want to talk about some of the matches. I'm not going to go through the whole card. Some of them I, I was less interested in than, than others. Uh, as, as somebody that's sort of a noob to, to New Japan, I knew most of the wrestlers, most of the talent because of Forbidden Door and AEW crossovers or just because I've actually looked these things up and tried to pay as much attention as I, as I can. And uh, I think I'll be paying more attention. The wrestling on these shows is unbelievable. Uh, that being said, that not all of the matches were unbelievable, but nothing was dreadful. Nothing was really terrible, except some of the booking decisions, specifically with, with Kyrie. Uh, Kyrie's match, <clears throat> she defended, she won, was maybe five minutes long. We get a five-minute women's match for the, I believe, the first women's match, either for a long time or ever at Wrestle Kingdom and five minutes. It was a great match. Like they came out of the gates hot, like fast and furious hitting each other, doing all these moves. Kyra gets the win really, really fun. And then the lights go out and the music starts playing and you get this vignette and then boom, there she is. It's, it's Mercedes Monet walking down the ramp in this righteous, like statue of Liberty costume uh, wearing the the red, white, and blue ring gear, working as a heel, saying I'm coming after a, after Kyrie, and it looked like there was some timing issue with the DDT that she's doing, which might be her new finisher coming up. And people were c- criticizing her her promo and the speed and stuff that she did it. And she she does do this thing where she lowers her register when she's when she's being threatening, and it felt it felt like maybe she was doing that here. I don't, I don't really understand what the problem was. Uh, her cadence has always been that way. So people are just being weird. I don't, I, I just, I thought it was fine. I, I, this is what I needed to know. Did she look good? Yep. Did the crowd react? Sure did. They sure did. When her face appeared on that screen, that, that very quiet, respectful Japanese crowd made some noise. And, and I thought that was pretty dope. So her coming down to the ring and debuting incredible, I liked it. A lot of people didn't like it. I don't care about them. I thought it was great. I thought it was a great move for New Japan, specifically for stardom. 
excited to see what she does in the States. Uh, I believe this coming week when she takes on Kyrie in San Diego. Uh, speaking of San Diego, we have a rematch in San Diego. Okada defeated Jay White to re- regain the IWGP World Heavyweight Championship. Great match. This match was was a lot of fun. Any other night, this would have been one of the best matches. It would have been the best match of the card. It would have been one of the best matches of the year. Not tonight, though. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna save that uh, for sake of time, so I can spend all my time talking about Kenny Omega and Will Osprey. Uh, Kenny Omega and Will Osprey. First of all, Kenny Omega getting the absolute video game final boss entrance was amazing. New Japan does cinematography and production like nobody else. WWE does really, really good stuff. Don't get me wrong. And in terms of producing a live event, I think they're second to none. But uh, it, when we're talking about production value and making a moment feel really big and really important at the same time, it's it's New Japan. That That's what they did with this. WWE does a great job of making things feel really Big, but not always necessarily really important, just really big. And that's a spectacle and it's a lot of fun. New Japan made me go, okay, this is a, this is, this matters. This is a thing that matters now. We're watching this thing and okay, here we go. Will Ospreay coming out, showing the video package before his entrance of all the Kenny stuff with him. And then coming into uh, his, his awesome United Empire uh, entrance and, and throwing up the, the W and the whole thing. The whole thing was good. And that led us to this match. We know we had that promo the night before at the press conference. Unbelievable by Will Ospreay. And I think he meant every word of it. I know he's probably working a lot there, but like he does really believe that Kenny wouldn't have survived the pandemic era uh, if he was the one that had to hold down all of New Japan Pro Wrestling. Match starts. Ospreay comes out hot, immediately tries to take off Kenny's head. And Kenny just ducks out of the way. There were a couple of spots that that were just incredible in here. Um, the the Kreutz Wrath, the 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 uh, the DDT on the top of the turnbuckle to bust open Will when the turnbuckle pad was removed. That was one of the most insane things I've ever seen in my entire life. I don't even know how they. I still don't understand it. Uh, and then there was just a Kenny working the back. The story of the match was really Kenny trying to work on Will's back. Uh, for for the bulk of the match, uh, I popped for Kenny yelling backbreaker before delivering a backbreaker, uh, and then uh, there's there was a uh, a spot on the ring apron right after Will kicked Kenny Omega in the face. I'm still convinced Kenny's head is flying somewhere. He hit him stiff, like the sound it made was disgusting. Uh, it was it was foul. It was perfect. And he held it there for a while. And then as he was all dazed and confused, Will went for the, uh, his, his, his os cutter and jumped off and Kenny just moved out of the way and Will landed on his back on the apron, which I thought was great. Like more people need to do that. Just simply just get out of the way when somebody leaps at you like that. Uh, and then we get the table spot. Uh, Kenny bringing the table on top of Will, stepping on it and then breaking it a little bit, going onto the apron and jumping two feet down, stomp down onto Will through the table, uh, giving Will a pretty gnarly laceration on his back and then leading to a shot that was criminally undershot because they were showing a replay of the stomp of Kenny Omega looking through the hole in the door and yelling, here's Kenny with maniacal eyes. Uh, and then when the the eye shot finally came on there, it was only on there for a second. Tyler, this match was amazing. The, the, the finish of the match, the comeback for Will after being bloodied and then just getting pummeled and the crowd really getting behind him by the end. And then Kenny calling for a, for the the one winged angel and people knowing what's coming, hitting hitting Will with one of the gnarliest V triggers I've ever seen. And then right into the one winged angel for the finish was amazing that match was beautiful it was violent it was frenetic it made perfect sense it had incredible psychology it told a story it had all of the elements of professional wrestling that you want in a match and more i had really high expectations going into this i think you know that it's why i picked up the the uh the the new japan subscription it's not even because of mercedes debuting uh it's because of that They exceeded him vastly. Final thoughts. This show had AEW, WWE, and New Japan talent wrestling on it. 
I cannot believe that that's a sentence I'm saying. Yes, it's because Carl Anderson signed a contract while he was still a champion. I understand that. Uh, but I don't care. Carl Anderson still wrestled there as a WWE talent. That is, that's nuts. That match was not great. Uh, Tom Taga looked really good in the match, taking the bulk of the offense from Carl Anderson for about half the match, maybe more before finally beating Anderson. <clears throat> Tom Tonga might be short lived there too, though. Uh, we don't know. Uh, it sounds like WWE has interest in him. I don't know when his contract is up, uh, but we'll, we'll have more con contract talk later on. I, I, I feel, I feel it in my question, uh, my bones. Yeah. Uh, that That's, that's one of my mom sayings. I, yeah. I feel it in my bones as well. There's yeah. uh, please continue, man. You're, you're on fire. <laughs> I don't really have much else to add other than uh, I really liked this. I forgot. I remember hearing this total, total experience. Like <laughs> the new Japan thing, doing it for the first time, watching it for the first time, wrestle kingdom. I mean, um, I forgot they had intermissions. So there's, there's just pauses, man. I would like AEW to have some intermissions. It was also a lot of, uh, it was a lot of fun having, uh, having the crowd uh, be, super invested by the end of the show they got up for that that kenny omega match like they were up for kenny and will in there uh where most of it was the the quiet respectful japanese crowd and i know it's because of the restrictions they're not allowed to chant they're not allowed to do certain things because they're still under covid restrictions and it makes sense you got like millions of people on a tiny tiny little island and you're all packed into a room if a couple of people are sick everybody's getting sick in there so uh, I, I totally understand the the mitigation policies, even though uh, it's got to make for a less than ideal wrestling event atmosphere, especially one of this caliber. This was huge. This was fun. Got to see a ton of dudes that I really like. That Zack Sabre Jr. match was incredible. There was so much good wrestling. I can't I can't overstate it. I do think that the first four or five matches on the card were way too short, and I'm sure it was to give time for the two co-main events. But there were some other, there were some other main event, main event talent, former, past, main event talent that got a lot of time on this show, and I think it was, it's hard to put into perspective how important Inoki was, where this was essentially an Inoki honor show. So there was a lot of stuff in there to sort of honor uh, Inoki and his legacy. Okada coming out in the ring with the robe on. Uh, there was there was so much stuff that that was probably put in there for fans of new Japan and the Japanese fan base that I don't have the context or perspective for, but I still enjoyed every second of it. I thought it was great. Uh, I, I really enjoyed this Tyler. I'm, I'm looking forward to doing this again. I'm probably not going to do it for, for the 17th, I believe is the next date. I'm not staying up late, especially now, but I'll probably check it out uh, after the fact uh, excited about it. Excited to have new wrestling on my radar that I wasn't, super into before even though i knew all these talents uh via via twitter clips and whatnot but it's uh it's it's pretty great man yeah well i appreciate you for many reasons uh foremost not only this recap but you were really one of my go-to sources for for the show because i i did not stay up uh actually i had work the next day as much as i wanted to um i figured that that my best choice was probably to just rely on twitter and you and uh, I knew the show was going to rule, but hearing you confirm that and hearing how high you were on Osprey versus Omega. I mean, I think you even said probably the best match you, you've watched live ever. Oh, ever. And of course, of yeah. course, when we really like something, there's maybe a, a tinge of recency bias, but you were extremely matter of fact. And I think you've had days to reflect on this and you're mm -hmm. still in love with that match. So I, I just, man, shout out to you for for your your coverage of this event. And like you said, shout out to the talents and everyone um, in front of the camera, behind the camera that made this show happen, because it seemed like it not only was amazing in the moment, but to your point, Brad, perhaps is bringing in new eyeballs yeah. to the product. And I think that also speaks to the reach of Mercedes Monet. And I think she can be credited with bringing a lot of potential new fans to the new Japan product. And finally, uh, battle in the Valley, February, San Jose, California. It's, it's on our radar, man. I, I think it's going to be a huge, huge show. And it's probably going to uh, eclipse the success of, of their efforts in San Jose last year. That's right. San Jose. And I think I said next week when I meant next month. Um, yeah, I, I can't. It's all, yeah, yeah. It's, it's all California, 
2023 it's happening uh tyler tyler one of our most viewed episodes was last week we had several hundred people tune in uh to to check us out and it was the mercedes it was the mercedes bump it's the The only thing that really changed so uh to, to think that she's not a draw and that people don't have interest and i know some people are curious and there were a lot of negative comments on there like the crowd didn't even react it's my my friends it's japan this is the way things are they're reacting much more differently than than you would react in the states it doesn't mean it's bad it means that it's different and uh i i think that if 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 tyler if it is a swerve and we find out this week that there is a different partner for for soraya we'll we'll know exactly what that pop is uh when she shows up i don't think it's going to happen but if it does we'll know for sure yeah, there's a weird sector of of uh, social media, an, an odd sector, I guess I should say, that just enjoys, um, you know, complaining about stuff. Or not even complaining, but just bashing on on creators and entertainers. And, um, you know, I, I think particularly there's a, a part of society that enjoys being very overly critical of Black women, whether that be politicians, entertainers, etc. So like you, uh, I think we our official message from GI is those people can kick rocks Yeah, because I thought like you, of course you can, you can sort of point out maybe spots that didn't go as planned, but I thought Mercedes debut ruled, like you said, the Titan Tron. I even really enjoyed the music. I will confess. I will confess that there is some, I think there is some validity in Carmela's tweet with the, the tea sip of, Oh, I I think my gimmick is that I'm money. And now uh, Mercedes, new new characters is all about money right the, the visual the audio etc i think carmella definitely has some validity but i i enjoyed it a ton brad and and it's yeah. just i i don't know how you don't see that and get excited whether the her, her new move was didn't go over as smoothly or the promo i mean like you said it was a sasha banks-esque promo so for the folks who are criticizing on twitter i just am shocked that people use use that much energy and time in their day to do that. And and if we're perpetually seeing people critique, uh, you know, women of color, particularly black women, I just, that that's not the spaces I roll in. So like you, I love this and Mercedes is going to do huge things wherever she goes. A new Japan, AEW potentially she's, she's the opportunity, right? She, she's the blueprint. Yeah. I, I, the, the Carmela thing, I definitely validity there, but uh, I think Sasha's used money motifs, for forever and her yeah. fucking last yes. name in wwe's banks her move yeah. was the bank statement and like, they, they were in nxt i think around the same time yeah the sasha banks character like you said was all about money yeah. carmella at that time was with enzo and Cass, and to my recollection didn't have money in her presentation really no and her presentation heavily, hasn't been mella it's just mella is money is is the thing but that's not right. her her gimmick at all her gimmick is hopefully gonna change when she comes back Cause that That's like, fantastic. I'm so pretty, I'm going to wear a mask thing and I'm just the most beautiful. Oh, okay. You're, you're, you're lovely. What does that have to do with winning? Like it's, 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 she's better than that. Um, she yeah. can be beautiful and kick people's ass. Like I don't, so many, so many women have had that gimmick over yes. the years in, in, in various companies. And it sort should of, not be here in 2023. No, it's the low hanging fruit. Yes. It's beautiful. I mean, of course, all of these women are beautiful and just magnificent, but I'm beautiful. And thus I'm a heel because you all want yes. me, but you can't have me. Yeah. I mean, we can name the beautiful people in TNA. We can name the Mandy Rose character for a long time. Uh, you know, WC, I mean, we could just go back, right? Pick the territory and we can probably name a, a handful of women that, had a similar 100%. character like you, I think also seeing Carmela live, just a, even a higher level of appreciation for her talent. And, and she's just, she's big time. I would love to see her, her character shift in a major way. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, hopefully, hopefully that happens. Maybe, maybe they bring her back to count, counter Mercedes Monet. Yeah. Right. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe that's a, maybe that's a few that we get at, yeah. uh, I don't know, WrestleMania, you know, 2030 or something. They do it at money in the bank. They're the final two to find out who really yeah. has money. And that's, <laughs> and that's how it ends. Yeah. Book it. I, I think it could be great. Uh, now you said that there is that sect of Twitter that goes after, just seems to have vendettas against entertainers and politicians. So right. I'm Tyler, not making that up, right? No, absolutely not. So let's go after some entertainers and politicians. Vince McMahon is back in the news, Tyler. This is a wild week. The, the headlines, the clickbait out there has been, has been kind of wild. 
Uh, also, media literacy is really, really low in this country where people read the headline and assume it means he's going to be doing creative. It doesn't sound like that's what's going to happen, but it doesn't mean that it won't eventually. Tyler, what are your thoughts on this whole Vince McMahon situation? And do you want to provide the people with any context? Yeah, it's uh, I'll, I guess I'll, I'll go the last part first. Thank you for, for passing that off to me. Uh, yeah. So the, you know, the press release uh, states that Vince will not be assuming any creative role uh, whatsoever. He is back in, in, you know, that leadership sort of organizing uh, likely a sale of the company. So he's very much working on the financial end of things and, and not, you know, in guerrilla, in charge of creative, so on and so forth, which is, I think, the fear of a lot of the, the community, especially for, you know, the women that work in the company. If you consider the allegations against Vince, which led to him putting out that tweet, effectively retiring, you know, I think a lot of the conversation now, of course, should be on the safety of the performers, particularly the women, not necessarily, oh, we're upset because creative is going to suffer. So yeah, the press release comes out, Vince is, is totally behind the scenes, Jones. And um, even if that is the case, which all signs seem to indicate that, I, you and I on air, off air, we're just talking about his tweet and how massive that was. I even think that was your storyline of the year yeah. for 2022 was Vince McMahon mm -hmm. credited for uh, a lot of the, the growth of professional wrestling over the last three decades is now leaving the business. To me, it's just, it's, it's pretty, on one hand, it's not shocking, but it's shocking that he would return. We started to see some of those tea leaves online about, oh, well, maybe Vince had a change of heart. Uh, reportedly he uh, is regretting that he was coerced into leaving in the first place. So it wasn't completely out of nowhere, Brad, but I think we know how, dare I say, some of these egomaniacal leaders work, whether that be, I mean, we won't run down the, the litany of people, but whether that be the CEO of UFC or, uh, you know, someone else who, uh, you know, was maybe in a position of power a few years ago, uh, these folks really love power and want to hold on to that power and want, yeah. want to hold on to that influence. And when they're not the discussion, when people aren't at their beck and call, I think they, they, they need that. They crave that like a drug. So then they show up and they want to sell NFTs and trading cards and, you know, just random. This is a rant for another person, but <laughs> I, I'm just, I'm shocked that he is, is back. It's really disappointing I'll just close by saying I hope this is true that it's just likely for the purpose of, of selling the company, whether that be to Amazon or Disney or, or whomever ends up with with the rights. I hope that's the case. I don't think anyone wants him back in in creative. And frankly, this man is what Brad in his seventies. Like I know he's he's a, now? I know he's a patented workaholic. I know that's part of his presentation, um, but this man should just go off and enjoy his, his years. I just, it's, it's disappointing that he's back again, particularly thinking of the women's locker room and, and not only that, but how many talents did we cover uh, who got released over the last year and a half, right? We we've had breaking news episodes of GI because of those massive layoffs. So I hope everyone is able to keep their position. I hope, uh, I hope we don't have to talk about Vince McMahon for any future episodes, but it's newsworthy. We need to cover it. And I, I am just honestly pretty surprised that that uh, things would change this quickly. What say you? All, all of the things I echo what you said. I hope it's just for the sale or not the sale. Uh, people being removed from the board and and people stepping down seemed pretty gross to me. It was uh, primarily the people that were uh, a part of the investigation into Vince McMahon were removed from the board. And I know he has power to do that. Uh, but man, I just, it's not a great look when you see that for the company. And yet the stock prices went up. And I know the prices went up for the sale potential, not because of the Vince McMahon return, but Vince McMahon, what Vince McMahon meant to the sale. So the thing, the thing that's crazy is that if they do a sale and a single buyer purchases out the WWE, and I don't know who has the cash to do it. Uh, lots of people are like, Tony Khan, go go buy it. Tony Khan doesn't have the money to buy WWE. WWE is worth probably plural billions at this point. At least. So, 
Yeah, at, at, at least the video library, the the trademarking, the um, the the TV rights deals, the there, there's just so much everything. And I think and, UFC sold for I forget how much, but it was just an, an insane amount, insane amount. I think Dana White's actually the president, maybe not the CEO of UFC. But yeah, if, if UFC went for that much, like you said, Brad, imagine WWE. It has to be that and and then some. Yeah, I'm trying to see right now if there's a. It says, uh, let's see, Vince McMahon by himself, <laughs> by himself has a net worth of three point two billion dollars. So my my guess is that it's 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 going to be a huge amount of money, and I don't know if a single investor is going to have it outside of like Bezos and Musk and a few other people, but uh, an entity might be able to do it. Something like NBC Universal, um, Comcast. That makes the most sense because the Peacock's right there. They already have the rights. They already have uh, USA Network. They have. It just makes all the all the sense in the world to just sort of like cobble it all together, gobble it up. The thing that scares me about that is that once a corporation gets a hold of it, that content's there, but now they're running the product itself, or they own the product itself, and they get to dictate who runs it. And I, I'm afraid they're going to WCW it to death like they did with time Warner AOL. And uh, that's, that's the only thing I have that, that, that scares me there where if it's somebody like a TK or somebody else that is in the wrestling business, that might make it a little bit easier uh, of a, of a transition or worse. It could go private again. It there's, there's nothing that, that says it has to stay public. So if a single buyer buys out the WWE, it's theirs. Now, if, if shares get distributed or the purchase goes some other direction, They'll probably like if NBC Universal buys it, they'll probably keep it public. But um, who knows? I don't know what's going to happen. It's it's really fascinating to see, but it's in my opinion, it's not a good look for the company to even be remotely related to somebody like this. But he is the majority owner, and he has all the legal rights and responsibilities and privileges thereof to be able to do anything he freaking wants. He has 70% of the voting power. He can remove people, add people. He can do kind of whatever he wants. So even though it's publicly traded and he has to follow SEC rules, he's still basically the sole owner of the WWE. So we'll we'll see what happens, man. It's it's going to be interesting uh, the next couple of months. And maybe no sale happens at all. Maybe nothing happens at all. Exactly, yeah. And this particularly hits kind of close to home because we, we've seen in the NBA – very similar situation mm-hmm. with Robert Sarver. And, yeah. you know, granted, I, I brought up Dana White and, uh, you know, Val, who, who shall go nameless. And ultimately, you know, it's politics, you know, vote for for uh, who you want. That's that's what we support here at GI. Robert Sarver, though, is, is I think, probably the, the best comparison of an owner who um, has all these allegations against him related to bad behavior. And then that's putting it in the lightest of terms. Right. And was forced to to sell the company. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I just wholeheartedly agree with you, Brad. I, I just don't think it's a good look at all. It's just kind of sad to me that Vince's, dare I say, ego wouldn't allow him to just leave as gracefully in huge air quotations as possible. I, I just, I don't like any of it. He's back and I, and I hope it's, it's not for a long time. Yeah. I hope we, we can, we can acknowledge his contributions, but also sure. say it's, it's time for you to please ride off into the sunset. I feel like we say this every every couple of months now where it's like, well, you're gone. You've done everything that you can. You built this massive empire. You changed wrestling forever. You Thank did. you. You did. Bye. We'll see you. Like you yeah. got billions of dollars. Just, Go enjoy them. Just, yeah. These, all these people we're talking about are extremely wealthy. But again, I think it's the the, the being in the news, the power. I, I mean, we don't know any of these people we're alluding to. But to me, it just seems like this common thread of, man, when you get that much power and you have that much money, I think your sense of just moral responsibilities and 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 it, it just gets really, really murky. Yeah, I think about it. Um, I think about it in, in, in a, a different way, too, in terms of development, uh, human development. He's probably at a stage in his life where he is faced with uh, an identity crisis. Uh, who am I crisis? He's been gone for what, six months, something like that. What is Vince McMahon without professional wrestling in his life? So he, I don't know that he's ever had it. He was helping to run a relatively small independent promotion 
that started gobbling up territories when he got control and made this small local thing that was doing doing shows in bars and in bowling alleys become the WWE. Nobody in this country, I think, doesn't know what WrestleMania is or hasn't heard of WrestleMania at the very least. Most people, I would say, probably know who Stone Cold Steve Austin is, or they certainly know who The Rock is. There's All of that is attributed to Vince McMahon. None of that happens without Vince McMahon. You can't underscore the important role that he's had for for better or for worse uh, in, in, in pro wrestling in America. So uh, like you said so eloquently, important that we acknowledge his contributions and we're thankful for them, but it's it's time to move on. Hopefully this stays business only, non-creative business as usual with what the WWE is doing because they're killing it over there now. It's uh, Hunter's doing a great job. Stephanie's doing a great job. Uh, I feel like they're they're doing a really good job compared to what it was. So we can complain about uh, booking and the matches and some of the stuff on Raw uh, or on SmackDown to a lesser extent. But I can't say that it's worse than what we were getting seven months ago, which oh, was yeah. Yeah. Pretty, pretty bad. You will not hear any arguments from me. I, I totally agree. <laughs> well, speaking of moving on, speaking of Raw and SmackDown, I think it's time to move into our weekly questions for each other. Longtime listeners or even recent listeners probably know how this works, Brad. Uh, we prepare questions for each other every week. I ask you one WWE question. You ask me one. Same for AEW. We don't know what the question's going to be, but we just roll into it and, and see what happens. So all that being said, are you ready for my WWE question? Oh, I'm ready. Let's go. Let's go. So some noteworthy uh, details from this week. The U.S. title matters again. It's really mattered since Hunter took over, as you mentioned, Brad, and continues to matter on Raw. Charlotte's first promo as champ on SmackDown. It seems like we're getting closer and closer to the honorary oofs, Sami Zayn being yeah. removed from the bloodline, which has all of our collective sphincters extremely tight. <laughs> we'll see what becomes there. However, my question for you is about a wrestler who I don't know that we discuss enough, frankly, on, on GI. AJ Styles, the mm -hmm. phenomenal one. So he suffered a broken ankle at a yeah. recent live show. Fortunately, no surgery is needed, but he did confirm on Twitter that he'll be out for some time. AJ is 45. Here's my question for you. What's been your favorite feud of his in WWE or elsewhere. And who do you need to see him wrestle before he hangs up the boots? Hmm. Great question. The person that I wanted to see him wrestle was Finn Balor. Um, we got that already. I, there's, I don't know. There's a couple of people. I think AJ and Johnny could put on a really good match. I think, uh, trying to think of who else he would match up really with, uh, well with, uh, we got AJ edge. AJ and I don't know. Uh, I don't know if you could call it a feud, but my favorite match of his anyway was AJ Styles, Samoa Joe, Christopher Daniels. Uh, yes. in CNA. Um, Unbreakable 05. Oh my God. What a match. Master, um, masterclass. It was, it was great. Uh, speaking of AJ Styles at Wrestle Kingdom this week, uh, in the middle of the Kenny Will match, uh, there was a Styles clash delivered. It was... Uh, yes. Pretty, pretty great. The crowd is popping for it. Um, AJ Styles is one of those kind of generational talents that probably got overlooked for too long before coming to the WWE. If, if he would have been there five years sooner, I, I, I imagine his run would have looked a lot different. The thing with AJ is that even though he's not quite what he was, he is still incredibly athletic and it, the athleticism is kind of overshadowed by his ability to, to react and his facials and his selling is so good that he has the ability to tell a story. Even if it's not quite what it was, it's, it's so effing good. Uh, I love AJ styles. Uh, I, I think I'm trying to think of younger talent. Um, Escobar would be great. I think oh, AJ styles, Escobar please. need that. Right? Um, I'd like to see AJ and Ricochet. I'd like to see. Love that. AJ and nobody from Judgment Day ever again forever. <laughs> that's, that's not your favorite AJ feud, I would take it. No, I, I'm just... 
I can't think of anybody else that we haven't really seen him. I think an AJ Styles Dexter Loomis thing could be really fun. I think uh, Dexter being more NXT creepy with AJ Styles, I think could be a blast because because AJ was so fun uh, in terms of selling during that Undertaker Boneyard match. I was going to say the Boneyard is probably a, a top top moment for for most fans of. Um, I loved uh, it. His WWE run. Yeah, that was that was great. He gave The Undertaker his last match. Yeah, it was great. During the pandemic, and it became really memorable, it, including when uh, uh, Taker put his arm through the glass, cut himself for real, and then looked at him bleeding and swore, and they bleeped it out, realizing, oh, that was not planned. That was him actually reacting to his bleeding arm. It was a fantastic piece of business. Yeah, it was so good. Uh, that that whole era is is underrated for the creativity they they allowed themselves to have to go like we have to make interesting crap because we're stuck inside and we can't leave. Um, so I, I still can't forgive the uh, the NXT uh, Street Pro- Profits Vikings Ninjas thing. The the what was the the Street Vikings or the Viking Ra- or the Street Raiders, whatever they call Viking Prophets. Viking yeah, I, I think I stored that in the very, the Awful. very back of my memory bank. Yeah, and it I know one, AJ, one of those names. Yeah, and I know AJ did some stuff in NXT, but there's talent there yeah, that I would love Grayson to see Waller. him mix it up with. Yeah, I'd rather. I, that's that's the one. That's the yeah. match, right? That's that's, that's Wrestle match, yeah. WrestleMania worthy. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, there's a whole bunch of people that I would love to see him uh, wrestle, but I. I uh, I have a feeling he'll just get he'll get stuck in there with Braun or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Melo Melo's the answer for me. I just remember being so infatuated with AJ Styles when I first discovered him in TNA. Uh, I think we've had a record number of TNA references, by the way, yes. over the last yeah. few weeks. Credit yeah. credit to the certified bag getter Jeff Jarrett himself, who may, maybe his name will pop up later in the show, maybe not. Uh, I just remember being so in, infatuated with AJ's work. This was probably two thousand four give or take when TNA was running those uh, weekly Wednesday pay-per-views and then when they ultimately secured a deal on FS1 and then Spike TV, so on and so forth. He, he, I, his style just really pun intended, I guess really appealed to me. I had the, the best of AJ and TNA DVD set. I had the action figure, which I wish I kept. I don't know where it is now. Dang. Probably sold out of the garage sale. I know. Right. But he just had memorable matches with abyss, Jeff Jarrett, you mentioned Unbreakable 05, which was a great shout. He, he's just he he's he's so influential to to my love of wrestling, and I hope when he comes back healthy and ready to go, that he just receives all the flowers for his presumably his last few years in wrestling. C- certified first ballot Hall of Famer. I- I'm so happy that he's gotten to run at the top of the card during his tenure in WWE. I know it's been reported everywhere that when Vince McMahon brought him in my last Vince McMahon reference today, when Vince McMahon brought him in, the thinking was, I think fight for reported this, that Vince really wanted his pit bull. Like, can AJ be the pit yes, bull? He wanted the pit bull. And who I would say, who would have thought this five ten guy with the Southern draw from Georgia ended up becoming WWE champion. Like, I, like you, Brad, I think all of us wanted to see this when we first discovered AJ styles. Uh, but could he, could he be one of those TNA talents who could actually translate in WWE? That was a real conversation for many years as Samoa Joe, AJ Styles. Could any of these dudes uh, make it in WWE and, and be successful? And AJ, AJ did, man. Dude, dude worked. Uh, he, Samoa Joe, I mean, all these TNA talents, Bobby Roode. It was great to see them shine. Uh, so, yeah, man, love AJ. Hope he heals well. And I, I need that Carmelo, Carmelo Hayes, AJ Styles match at a future WrestleMania. Yeah, and all, all these things, all of these wrestlers you just referenced, uh, Bobby Roode especially, hopefully he recovers as well because I need to hear his ring music again, uh, which is probably the most underrated theme in all of WWE. It's, great. it's such a great theme. I play it in my classroom <laughs> all the time uh, when kids enter. Yes. Uh, Glorious is such a great song. Yes. Um, but, it, but it reminds me of the past, man. Uh, Tyler, we haven't done one of these in a while, but it's time for Back in the Day. Play the music. And now it's time to get old school. Prepare yourselves for Back in the Day.
Yeah, man, let's go ahead and roll into it. So we are turning back the clock to the year 2000. Wow, that was a minute ago. Specifically, the Royal Rumble. We know we're approaching the Royal Rumble here in a few weeks, but the reason we selected this is because it was the debut of Taz. Yes, Taz with two Zs. Yeah. He fought Kurt Angle. Obviously, Taz appeared on Twitter this week. He he had some time to interact with some internet trolls. He's still giving with his time. And I think they were talking about um, homegrown talents in AEW, and there was some criticism of AEW doesn't grow talents, blah, blah, blah. Taz responded, and, and I think um, his debut may have been mentioned, or maybe I just took it there, right? Uh, so anyway, Taz was was really noteworthy for his work, not only on screen, but off screen via Twitter this week. And so you and I came up with the idea of, man, well, Taz is, is relevant. He's awesome. We're huge fans. Royal Rumble is coming up soon. The, the poster for this year's event was released. What if we go back to Royal Rumble 2000, Taz's debut? So this started with Kurt Angle in the ring, uh, Howard Finkel. Uh, in the ring announcing Kurt Angle has arrived. Kurt Angle was a huge heel at the time. Uh, this is at MSG in New York City. Kurt is just burying the audience. He even mentions Patrick Ewing, which yes. I popped for, Brad. Yes. This clip is available on WWE's <laughs> YouTube. We'll, we'll link it, of course, on, on our socials for you all to see. So Fink's on the mic. I'm already loving it because Fink, Fink, Fink was an icon. Yeah. Um, Angle takes a shot at Pat Ewing at the home team. And... This match was promoted that Angle would be facing a mystery partner. Mm -hmm. So what stuck out to me, Brad, was that even, again, this is the year 2000, man, even before Twitter or or um, the various dirt sheets, if you will, that exist now, this crowd knew who Angle's mystery opponent was. Oh, yeah, was the, chat, they, the chat rooms were popping. They, they were popping. Yeah, they, were, yeah. they were chanting for Taz at MSG. So, you know, Angle um, cuts this, this heel promo for, for a minute or two. And then when we hear the heartbeat music and then the flat line, I put this in my notes, Road Warrior Pop. Yes, enormous. The crowd chanted, we yeah. want Taz. And they got Taz. What did you think of the pop, Brad? And then uh, as we went into this very short match, it was only about four to five minutes. Um, did, did you remember this match at all? And, and what did you think turning back the clock? Now we see a young Kurt Angle, but talk about talents from other companies and, and there being some worry about how they translate. What did you think about Taz's initial presentation in, in WWE? So one of the things that I, I remembered about this was exactly what it was. The, the short, uh, huge pop. I forgot it was Madison Square Garden. Uh, I, th I think the Kurt, so the Kurt Angle stuff was, it was early Kurt. He was still, he had won a belt yet, but he was uh, undefeated. And he was doing the thing where I'm wholesome Olympic gold medal winner and you should cheer for me because I am a, an actual champion. And he started doing, that was when he initially started doing the it's true, it's true stuff. Uh, God, it was so good because he said the Patrick Ewing thing. He said, Patrick Ewing, because you're probably never going to win a championship here. You'll be waiting forever. It's true. It's true. And he looked around. Amazing. Amazing stuff. He was so good so early, so fast. And the crowd the whole time was chanting, we want Taz. As soon as he said mystery part or mystery opponent, we want Taz, we want Taz, we want Taz. Crowd was going crazy. Taz came out, enormous pop. I love the presentation because they didn't change a lot. First of all, Taz's entrance theme is like, I'm ready to run through a wall. Uh, absolutely incredible. You are you are 100% muted. Uh, can't hear a thing. Simple yet impeccable. Yes. Yes, it's it, very yeah. simple. So good. The, the, the flat line and then the guitar hits all distorted. Uh, incredible. Now, now he did say some stuff. I'll save until after we've been talking here, but uh, he did say some stuff about this this match and and, and what happened. And I thought, uh, despite that first that first suplex, almost decapitating Kurt Angle, uh, I thought the other suplexes were great. I love that Kurt still got in a ton of offense, and I love that the Taz mission was applied at the end. But they didn't call it that. They didn't call it anything. They said he's got him in that that modified sleeper. Sleeper hold, that's a choke. That's illegal. What are you letting? And it, it was very confusing. I, I hated the whole ending because it, it felt a little bit like they were burying his finishing move, which is his finishing move because he can get behind you and he's dangerous that way. If he gets behind you, you're screwed. Otherwise, he's a lot smaller than you are. So 
I feel like burying the one thing that separates him besides the being the human suplex machine was was really a dumb look. But uh, I otherwise thought he looked like a badass out there. Uh, he beat Kurt Angle when nobody had beaten him yet, even though I don't think they he counted it against himself on Monday because it was a, an illegal move. Uh, but it was uh, I thought it was great. I it was short. It gave the crowd what they wanted. We got a Taz debut. People were buzzing about it. Um, and I don't think they changed a ton from his presentation from ECW. 100%. Yeah, we got the, uh, there was a really great overhead belly to belly off the yes. second rope from Taz. Uh, way earlier in the match, Kurt Angle even suplexed him on the entrance ramp. Yep. This is just a, a really fun four to five minute debut. Unfortunately, to your point, great, great shout about the, the commentary. Uh, I think some of the on-character presentation here of Taz in terms of, you know, the, these quote-unquote illegal or dangerous moves that seem to then put some heat on him backstage. Not necessarily from, from the commentary team, but that suplex you referenced, that German that he was attempting on Kurt. Obviously, the first attempt, it, it just looked awkward, right? Because Kurt sort of went back, but Taz wasn't ready to deliver it to him. Second attempt, okay. He, he has the German, uh, you know, angle flips over. Yeah, it was like a released flip release. Release. Fl yeah, but and Taz, uh, obviously, I think folks know by now that you and I are pretty big fans of his. And Taz even had his own podcast for several years called The Taz Show. Taz has been quoted as saying he, he got a lot of heat backstage from that from that first debut. People uh, gave him the label of being an unsafe worker when he would argue that things were great with him and Kurt. And he, in fact, it looked awkward, yes, but he was sort of saving Kurt because they weren't on the same page in that moment. So on one hand, I was super stoked anytime I, I, I re-watch Taz's debut because he's one of my all-time favorites. On the other hand, I think, wow, if, if that particular moment in the match didn't happen, how far could Taz have risen in WWE? Because unlike AJ Styles, Taz never really sniffed that main event world title picture for a prolonged period ever. And as a Taz mark, I really wanted that for him. So I just sort of wonder, man, if, if, if you could just change that moment in the match, how does history rewrite itself in terms of his WWE legacy? But yeah, man, Road Warrior pop, the New York crowd was just so thirsty for the human suplex machine. I, I, I love, uh, loved reliving this match with you. Yeah, it was great. Uh, J JR had a comments about this and essentially Taz came back and said, I'm screwed. And, and he asked why he said, like, I got an enormous reaction from the crowd for a presentation that they didn't build here. So he, he, I think he kind of knew the writing was on the wall. It was going to change. It was not going to be the presentation from ECW. He's getting recognized for what he's done in other places, but it's already over for him because they're not going to be getting that same thing in the WWE. So, and, and that's kind of how it worked out. Uh, ultimately, Taz had a pretty short run, uh, all things considered, in the WWE and then transitioned to commentary, which I thought was unbelievably successful. And he's been in multiple promotions for 20 years now doing commentary. So uh, it, it all worked out. So the wrestling debuted, not the best, but what what can you say, man? Uh, Taz is still there uh, doing commentary 23 years later and now doing it for AEW. And speaking of AEW, Tyler, it's time for the AEW questions. Yeah, let's make it happen. So I have some extended exposition. Here, so bear, <laughs> bear, bear with me. I really enjoyed all of AEW shows this week. That's probably no no surprise to many. Um, their Seattle and Port Portland debuts were uber successful, in, in my opinion, as a viewer. We even have a massive episode of Dynamite this Wednesday in LA. Uh, we can obviously run down the card, but there's just huge match after huge match. Jungle Hook is even debuting, and I think we're getting a Mercedes debut, but we shall see. However, we must mention my favorite match from this past week. AR Fox versus Swerve Strickland. Brad, you mentioned gnarly spots during Osprey versus Omega. I saw the most painful looking Death Valley driver ever. That Swerve hit on AR Fox. Oh, yes. Uh, from the rope on yeah. the apron. Looked awful. <laughs> Just looked awful. <laughs> that looked, yeah. Like, it was incredible. I, yeah, instant wins for me. The whole crowd. I, just, I'm just, I'm just glad Fox was okay. Yeah. Uh, 
and, and Swerve ended up picking up the dub in just an awesomely athletic bout. Uh, shout out to their their Lucha Underground rivalry, which was uh, mentioned on on commentary in kind of a subtle way. So here's my question though: the newly adjusted presentation of Swerve with Parker and Painted Man Jones. Taz's words, not mine. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> he's, <laughs> okay, he's so good he's, at commentary. He's the best. Yeah. Uh, it received lots of questions <laughs> from from the timeline, right? And upon its debut a few weeks ago, when when they attacked yeah, Keith Lee, still. Is this more this repackaged presentation? Is this more about elevating Swerve to potential TNT gold, or are we seeing the beginning of a threat? in the trios division. Hmm. I don't know that it's for, I think it's, man, that's a really good question. Does Swerve need elevating? I, I think it's more about elevating the other two with Swerve because Swerve is already pretty elevated. I don't think Swerve needs to be elevated. I think Swerve is a, an immediate threat to, to Darby. I think Swerve is an immediate threat to anybody in the company. Like he's, he's that good. So I don't think he needs to be elevated at all. I think it's let's elevate Parker charisma vacuum uh, Boudreaux and uh, painted man Jones, whoever this guy is. I, I, I like them coming out in the tees, everybody wearing the tees that looked really good this time. And they both, those dudes slow walking to the ring. I thought looked awesome. I thought it's got a great look and it has a ton of potential. I just don't care about either of them right now, which is why I think Swerve will help elevate those two. Uh, I also think it's kind of great that um, maybe, maybe it's undervalued and maybe I'm overthinking this, but I think it's really great that the leader of this flag faction is a uh, former tag champion who happens to be a black man. And then the muscle for this black man are the two white dudes that are like the most white dude of white dudes. Uh, right. Like all tatted up. I just, I, I see them both at a biker rally and they're working for <laughs> swerve. And I thought that was, yeah. uh, I think that's a really no. cool touch mm -hmm. there. No doubt. no doubt. Um, so kind of, kind of like when, uh, Jade, we'll, we'll get to Jade in a moment. I think, uh, when Mark Sterling was with Jade, it's like Jade is this phenomenal sister who's, yep. who's basically telling Mark what to do. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And I know in, in, in the world of pro wrestling, that that's probably not even, I don't know if that's really a storyline until somebody points it out. Uh, I, I really don't. Cause Mark Sterling is, he's, he's a lawyer gimmick. So what other lawyer gimmicks do you have lying around? But at the same time, it's like that look is, is a little bit more important. I think than than we give it credit for. And I feel the same about this. So it's a good question. I don't think it's to elevate swerve. I don't, think it has anything to do with swerve at all i think it has everything to do with the other guys and i think if they do well enough together then yes it could be a legitimate threat because those those are enormous human beings yeah that they are i was one of those people i referenced that was skeptical about the presentation uh i was just like what like, what is going on with this yeah. painted man and you you do your um you know internet sleuth research it's like oh this guy's just like a white guy from <laughs> who played baseball and was really really good but yeah like is there some cultural appropriation here with the hair or what, what's happening? I thought this past week was a very effective presentation for all the reasons you listed about them just being quiet, menacing guys and, and, and that air of mystery, certainly around Parker, but definitely around painted man Jones. Yeah. Like we, we know nothing about him really, except our own internet research. Um, so yeah, this was really effective. I agree with you to me. I, hmm, I don't know who wins at revolution, assuming this is the revolution match between swerve and Keith Lee. I don't know who goes over. I tend to believe both dudes need the win here. So this is probably a discussion for a future episode of GI, but I could easily see Swerve being the guy to take the belt off Darby. Like that, these two guys have history together on the indies, both Washington, uh, you know, dudes. That, that To me, Swerve, future TNT gold this year. And uh, like you said, I think just being around Swerve, these two dudes will be elevated. So I, I definitely see Swerve as TNT champion before I see mogul affiliates being in the, the trios title picture. In, in my universe, House of Black wins the trios title this year and holds on to them for, for a very, very long time. I hope so, because that would rule. I love House of Black. There's so many great trios that are uh, that are in this company that uh, I, I think adding one or two more, I'm... I'm good. 
I'm happy. The, the more, the merrier. Okay, Tyler, this week, we got a live rampage. We also got a live Battle of the Belts this time on Friday. So thinking about Battle of the Belts, is this the right move? Or do you think the Saturday Battle of the Belts gimmick is still the way to go? Selfishly, wonderful question. Selfishly, uh, I, I really enjoy Battle of the Belts being on Saturday. However, I think putting it behind Rampage on Friday makes a ton of sense. That This was probably, in my opinion, the most effective Rampage and Battle of the Belts presentation thus far. Like you said, I think Rampage is really on a hot streak. It's funny, but off air, you and I were discussing how uh, Rampage and Battle of the Belt seems to kind of be like a, a basketball where it's a game of runs, right? Yeah. For a month, we're super down on Rampage. And then a couple months later, we're super high on it, just like we are now. Great episodes of both. I just want to point out that we had a special episode of Gimmick Infringement. We partnered with That's Freaking Wrestling. We had Matt on a Fantasy Draft. You can find it on your podcast platform or on uh, the 19 Media Group YouTube page. I just want to point out here, Brad, that Jade had probably my favorite match of these two shows. She defeated Sky Blue. Great showing for Sky Blue. Just a reminder to you and everyone that I do not regret choosing Jade and the baddies with my number one pick. I, Brad, I secured, I don't think the timeline gave this enough love, frankly. I'm going to be a little petty. I secured Jade and Bianca, the dream match for the culture, and yet Matt completely demolished us in our, our Twitter poll. And, and deservedly so. Like, the dude had some heavy hitters on his roster, but I just want to remind everyone that Jade has been her for a long time, and, and the best is yet to come. My answer for you, though, Friday – Back to back. This makes so much sense. And when the talent delivers in such a massive way, I, I just think it it's it's seamless to have it go back to back instead of asking folks to deliver another commit another day uh toward watching wrestling. Even if it's only for an hour, I think having that two hour format will, will prove to be uber successful. How about you? Agree, disagree? No, I I I mostly agree. I, I kind of like having the I kind of like having a bookend on, on Rampage because we had a battle of the belts that was weird where Rampage aired and then we got battle of the belts in a pre-taped show. And I think it was Friday and then Saturday, but it was Rampage aired and Takeshita came out all red and chopped up That's for right. his match. It was weird. He was like, why is he True. all beat up? And then we see that he was actually on Battle of the Belts, which was filmed first before Rampage. And then that aired the following night. And it was just really strange, all the timing there. I, I did not care for that at all. So I kind of like that they bookend them. It gives us a reason to watch Rampage. And if it's a live Rampage, I'm tuning in no matter what live. Uh, if it's regular Rampage, if I miss it, I miss it. But I try to watch it. Same with SmackDown. I try to watch it. It's actually less convenient for me to watch SmackDown, which is weird because it's earlier. But uh, I like Battle of the Belts being on Saturday if it's not a dumb Saturday to have it on. Like, it can't be a huge college football weekend. It can't be uh, there are other playoffs happening. It can't be anything like that. I know things are going to get wonky during the the NBA season, I'm sure, with, with, uh, with TBS and we'll, we'll see what happens, but yeah, when the playoffs start. And yeah. Right. So once, once we get into later, once we get into the spring and, and whatnot, uh, we'll, we'll see what happens, but you know what? I I'm, I'm just happy we're getting battle of the belts and it feels important. It feels like, Ooh, these, these are, these are things we should watch. They're live. They're must see if it's taped. I don't, I'm not that invested. I don't, I don't feel the need to watch it live. I feel the need to watch it eventually but not live it's different yeah absolutely yeah. It's, it's it's different for me actually saturdays i i can de definitely typically commit to watching that live it's just weird with fridays when it comes on so late for me i just know that i'm going to end up watching it recorded so on one hand selfishly i like saturdays because i know i can i can probably tune in live for it friday's a little bit of a different story but like you said if it's live, there's just a certain level of excitement. Yeah. And I think history thus far has proven that the live shows have definitely delivered consistently, whereas the taped ones, it's been really hit or miss. I mean, you and I have spoken about it before. Rampage started off on a really promising note. Uh, I think the first one, right, was I think 
was CM Punk the first or the second one? Second one. The, okay, the second one. I think the first, first one was first Kenny was Christian, Omega Christian versus Cage Christian match. Cage, yeah. right? Yeah, that was the very, very first Rampage match. So when you start out with those two back-to-back weeks, I think they set our bar pretty high, which we yeah. enjoyed. And it, it, it's, like I said, it's been hit or miss. So I'm totally cool with the two-hour, even if that means that I may not be able to watch it at that very moment. Yeah. And I, I know you have your routine and you have your schedules and something – is back on your radar. Something is going to be back on your schedule, Tyler. It's time to bring it back. It's once again a chance for us to dive in to a rose from Tyler. And now for a rose from GI's most eligible bachelor. Yeah, man, we're back like we never left. I hit you up with this idea, I think only a day ago. It just occurred to me that The Bachelor is coming back in just about two weeks, Monday, January 23rd. And to my surprise, the cast has been revealed online. So in my first of many conversations about The Bachelor over the next few months, I just want to give you, give us a quick preview so uh, again, it's, it, it's back, Brad. The Bachelor is returning for its 27th season. That's not including The Bachelorette. That's just The Bachelor. Yep. 27. Unbelievable. Jesse Palmer, former NFL quarterback, remains the host. But this season's Bachelor is a dude named Zach Shalcross. Pre- pretty baller last name. <laughs> it's, you, it's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. You may recall he made Rachel's final three before being eliminated in a pretty epic way. In summary, he and Rachel apparently had an awkward overnight or fantasy spin. I don't even remember. Is this, is this the Zach with one C? Or no. It's CH. C- yeah, this dude okay, is a C-H. I think He's, I remember us having this conversation. Some, some, rede- some yeah. redeeming qualities, yes. as it were. He and Rachel last season, Bachelorette, apparently had an awkward fantasy suite overnight experience that did not go over well. It's all pretty nebulous for for the audience we never got the exact details but alas here we are he has been described by some as a bit of a charisma vacuum so there i will tell you there's a lot of controversy amongst bachelor nation about his selection to even be the lead this season there were at least legitimately four to five other uh, candidates for bachelor who who people seem to want more but for whatever reason they chose this dude and uh, he has 30 women now vying for his heart. So I just want to quickly go over some of these contestants. We have a really diverse mix in terms of regions represented. We have Florida, California, Texas being some of the more uh, popular uh, places are having the most contestants. And in terms of occupations, I know this is what you've been waiting for. Yes. Here are some of the ones that stand out. We have... Christina Mandrell, who is 26. She is a content creator from Nashville, Tennessee. We have a lot of folks in marketing. There's a woman named Davia from South Carolina who's a marketing manager. And we have Jess, 23, from Winter Springs, Florida, who is an e-commerce coordinator. I still don't really understand e-commerce. I don't know about you, but... uh, that's her her profession. Business owners, patient care technicians. We have uh, a healthcare strategist. Her name is Allie from Atlanta, Georgia. I mean, all of these women are beautiful, Brad. I don't know anything about them other than the the name, age, occupation, and and location. But I, I would be lying to you if I didn't say I am excited. I'm willing to give Zach a shot. And finally, we have Brooklyn, who I almost forgot. Brooklyn is 25. She is from Stillwater, Oklahoma, and she she takes the prize for number one most interesting occupation. I never know if these occupations are real, but according right. to according to ABC.com, Brooklyn from Oklahoma is a rodeo racer. Amazing. So we'll see. I'm stoked for this. Again, we got to wait two weeks for episode one to actually debut, but. Uh, I just, I love this segment. I'm so grateful that you give me the airspace for it and uh, much, much Bachelor talk to come. (laughs) I love that. (laughs) I love when you say things like that because it feels both promising and like a threat at the same time. (laughs) It's both. Oh, it's it's, (laughs) a little bit of both. Yeah. 
It's absolutely both. Yeah, it's it's going to happen. It's going to be glorious. And uh, we, we know it's a big draw for GI. So no, absolutely no one skips over these five minutes. <laughs> this is must-see every single week. So I'm, I'm – uh, I love it. I absolutely love it. It's, it's, uh, it's definitely, it plays to our moniker here. Uh, we're more than just wrestling that we are. So let's talk about more wrestling after I say that, um, Tyler, I didn't get to ask you my WWE question. So no, um, we we skipped over it. Yeah. I'm, I'm thinking I'm going to edit all this out and, and put it earlier, but we'll see. Embrace the mess. Not long after the regime change, the WWE announced that they wouldn't be looking to sign people who aren't coming out of the PC. Will Ospreay's contract is coming up, and he's probably not coming over. Uh, he wants to stay in New Japan and doesn't want to live in the States. But Tamatanga, that's Haku slash Meng's adopted son, he might be on the move. Is the WWE interest in international talent a Triple H thing, a WWE thing, or something else, given that they said they don't want to sign people that weren't trained specifically uh, by them? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's got to be a Triple H thing, no? Uh, I think we're moving to this era, uh, this era of collegiate athletes being recruited and, and that being the, the future of, of what the roster looks like. To me, this totally screams Triple H's influence and his his appreciation for uh, wrestling beyond our, our U.S. shores. So, yeah, it's it's, it's a hundred led initiative. I would surmise, and I think that's part of what we loved about Black and Gold NXT. At, at least for me, is that I was being exposed to all of these talents who I, I didn't know, whether that be U.S. independents or even talents like Shinsuke Nakamura. Asuka, you know, these people who I, I just wasn't hip to, but now are, are faces of NXT and have been really successful on the main roster. Mm-hmm. So shout out to Hunter for that. If that is his doing, I think that's one of the strongest attributes he brings to the table is that he, his reach can go just beyond the, can go beyond the United States. Same for you. Or do you think it's part of uh, s- some other element is, is making this happen? I don't know. I think it's, I think it's a bit of both. Like why go after somebody that, you know, is there? Oh, because, because it's, it's Meng's kid and he's enormous and he's really good. Having a, a really talented, large dude with a lineage is absolutely something WWE is interested in. I don't think they care where he comes from. Uh, according to, I think Fightful's reports, they were interested in him it, uh, seven years ago. And uh, now they're interested again. And, I, you know what? I'm here for it. I'd, I'd like to see him get that money and uh, do something else. He's currently a champ, though. So we'll we'll see. He just won the championship back from Carl Anderson. So I don't I don't see that happening anytime soon. And that that match wasn't exactly something to put on the highlight reel for a job, even though most of it wasn't your fault. Uh, the the finish of that match was even commentary stopped talking because uh, the move was just sort of whiffed. And uh, it was it was sold anyway. So uh, I, I don't really know what happens there, but I think it's probably more Triple H than anything else. It seems to be the only thing that makes sense, uh, because why would anybody else or why would the company decide suddenly to change their ways and their mindset? I, I feel very much like it was probably Triple H. And right. uh, it's probably the best move for business because he's he's ready to go. He can wrestle today and and be really good for what they need. Yeah, and, and two points. Who's to say it has to be mutually exclusive, right? Like you can take right. the the this NIL partnership they have, you can take that approach and still recruit that veteran talent, whether that be in the US or overseas. And secondly, I believe he's 40, Tomatonga. Yeah. So I just yeah. love seeing talents. It seems like their their lifespan in the business is being extended in this generation now more than ever. Um, like we, we hear that this notion that at least on the men's side of things, you're often not hitting your prime until your mid thirties. And we have talents everywhere who are 35 and older across various companies yeah. who are at the top of the card. Or, we just and talked about or, AJ Styles. Yeah. And, or exactly 45, like Chris Jericho, right? Dude is on the other side of 50. Years old. Yes. And it, it is one of the most um, essential talents in, in, in the, in AEW. So yeah, I just love, even though I'm not very hip to Tomatonga's career, I, I think seeing a dude who's 40 who could potentially get this opportunity to shine on, on this stage in the U.S. if he wants that, 
I just love seeing that. And uh, it's, I just, it's just great to see people get in that recognition. And then if I can be exposed to their work, man, that's, that's a double win for me, happy for them. And then happy for me yeah. to ex- expand my, my palette. Yeah. And I think, uh, I think that just the interest in there might get people to check out new Japan might get people to check totally. out that dude's work. So yeah. the WWE is a, you can't deny that it's a needle mover. It's, it's something that gets eyes on other products, even if they're just looking at them indirectly. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm here for any talent getting paid, especially when they're in the later stages of their, their careers. I think that's really great. Uh, especially if they haven't gotten their flowers, right? Like AJ, AJ Styles not getting their, his, his flowers internationally on a global stage. And I guess universally internationally, not just in an international market. I had no idea he was in Bullet Club, for example. I found out way later. AJ yeah, Styles. Was the whole thing. Is the whole thing. Right. Like, I, I feel like the introduction to AJ Styles was probably the, the Royal Rumble, right? Uh, for for a lot of people, except for people that were hardcores watching TNA, so him coming in in his 40s is pretty pretty great too. Uh, even though he was doing really great things and set up Kenny taking over the Bullet Club when he was in New Japan, so yeah, it was a, that, it was a that, whole thing. That moment with Ro- with Roman in the Rumble was so good. Granted, the ca- I think you the camera the work, same eh? critique. The, the yes. camera, <laughs> like yeah. I want to see Roman's reaction, but I kind of care more about. I want to see four see- minutes of him going. Yeah, yeah. Squinting and with his mouth open. Yeah, no, that I really believe that was the one of the more effective Royal Rumble debuts in, in recent time. He, uh, yeah, he was just off to the race. I'm just so happy that AJ's time in WWE ha- has been what it is. And hopefully we still see him in, in a prominent spot when he comes back. Well, Tyler, it's uh, it's time to close it out. Let's uh, let's talk about what we're looking forward to this week. What are you looking forward to? Yeah, man. Two two things jump off the page to me. Uh, one, like you, it's the first week back of the semester. So I was back in the office last week on campus, but obviously a much different feel with with thousands of students being back. So I'm, I'm really eager to, to see them and, and uh, you know, just uh, start a new semester with them and, and welcome everyone back and hopefully all are, are healthy and happy. And then secondly, there is a live show put on by championship wrestling of Arizona this weekend. It's on Saturday. It's in Mesa in the East Valley, which is on the other side. Like I, I am not close to Mesa whatsoever, but there's a possibility of me. There's a, there's a yes. 33rd and a third percent chance or Saturday. higher, yes. probably higher of me potentially going on Saturday night. Eddie Kingston is advertised for the show. That's, right. That's the a show. friend okay. told me that Ortiz should be there as well, along with some other talents. I think like Sweet. Alex Hammerstone and oh, cool. hopefully, yeah, hopefully we see a lot of women uh, on the card too. I'm not as sure who, who's uh, being promoted there. Maybe even pretty Peter Avalon. I know he has a, he's pretty big on the Arizona scene here. So championship wrestling, Arizona, Mesa, Bell Bank Park. That is this Saturday. And rest assured that if I do end up attending, you'll, you'll be hearing about it on uh, on next week's episode. So yeah, man, school, some wrestling. Obviously we have a huge dynamite Hopefully Raw and SmackDown will rule. I am just so grateful for all of these, these, uh, you know, these things I can look forward to this week. I think she, I think it should be a great one. How about you? What's, what's on tap? I know you, you got some tigers coming back to campus. What, what else you got, uh, got brewing here? I was trying to find the card. Uh, I gave up, but uh, yeah, I yeah, have, I, uh, I, I couldn't find it anywhere. Um, I just know Eddie Kings, Eddie Kingston is the main draw. Yeah. I remember that. I remember that. Yeah, I think yes. you sent it to me and I was like, man, yeah. I might have to go up there and then I'm not going to go up there. I'm yeah. going to be probably just struggling to stay awake uh, at the end of this week. This week will probably be kind of hellacious, even though I know we have a quick turnaround. So I'm looking forward to seeing the kids again. Haven't seen them for a couple of weeks, so it'll be nice to see their faces again. Uh, so, some of them anyway. It'll be nice to have my prep period back. I'm looking forward to having planning time. Yes. Officially, I checked I... my roster. I checked my schedule. Oh, man. Uh, ironic that I had a health class and it led to the downfall of my own personal health. So uh, I should have laughed, but I, I know it no, was it's funny. It's funny. It was a journey. It's, it's, it's ironic. It's, I was going to say it's ironic. Um, yeah. So I'm looking forward to that. I don't really have anything else that I'm looking forward to other than like, I'm just glad to be back to, to work and back to having a, a, a prep period. I've been working on a whole bunch of projects on the side, doing stuff for 19, doing stuff for us, trying to, trying to figure out like next steps and really trying to hone my, hone my skills 
I love learning. I love getting to practice and I love creating. So I've been doing a lot of that. I'm sad to see that go, but I know I'll continue that into the, uh, into the future. So I'm looking forward to it. And I can't wait for everyone to see what you've been working on. I know we don't have an official release date, but the the snippets and the previews I, I've gotten of what you've created for not only GI, but uh, but 19 Media Group and some of our, our colleagues on the roster. I just, man, I'm sorry. You probably get tired of me saying, oh my gosh, this looks great. This is fresh. Fire emojis. <laughs> but I, I love seeing you, like you said, not only learn, but sort of um, just create, right? Like ultimately, I think you, you get so much joy out of building and creating. And I just can't wait for people to, to see what you've been, you've been cooking up here. So yeah, man, should be a great week. We are so thankful for all of you who listened and or watched us. Uh, our gratitude is to you each and every single episode. If you haven't already, please check out the site. We are gimmickinfringementpod.com. You will see all of our episodes there as well as different articles that Brad and I have produced. We certainly have more cooked up. We're just kind of taking the scenic route to get there. I know every time we meet Brad, I'm inspired yeah, to write. And then, me too. And then, I don't know, like- Life happens. Naps, naps happen. Yep. And, and other, other avoidance uh, uh, going on. But we certainly are gonna have some more pieces. If you haven't already, please check out our inventory there. But uh, rest assured that there will be new material coming your way very, very soon. Brad can be found on Twitter at Win Duster. I can be found there at Tyler J. McDowell. We can be found on Twitter at 19M Group. Uh, shout out to them, all the support we get from our colleagues over there. If you haven't peeped the roster, please do so. And all in all, we hope you enjoyed this episode and we will see you on the next one. Gimmick Infringement is a part of 19 Media Group. You can listen to us on Good Pods, our premier partners, and Apple, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or wherever you find podcasts. You can also find us on YouTube via the 19 Media Group channel. Please like, subscribe, comment, and share.